Okay, first of all, wow. Mazel tov, everyone. Um, how beautiful. And uh, I, I am just so honored and thrilled to be with you here today. Uh, my name is Dean Rachel Friedman, and I founded Lamdenu, an institute for advanced, accessible, and inspiring Jewish tech study on Zoom worldwide and in person in Teaneck, New Jersey. It's really an honor for me to join the Hadram Siyum today and to deliver these words of Torah and reflection. As a young woman, I studied and practiced American law. After the birth of my daughter, who's the second of my three children, I transitioned to my vocation and avocation as a teacher of Torah. I spent 17 years, as Michelle alluded to, as Rabbi Nick Michelle alluded to, at Grisha Institute in New York City, where I served as chair of Bible and associate dean. Eight years ago, I founded Lamdenu, and I have the joy of teaching and learning there every single day. You may visit us at lamdenu.org, and I look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much to Rabbi Nick Michel for inviting me to participate in the Hadran Siyum and Masechet Yivamot. And thank you so much to Maggie Sandler and everyone who worked so hard to bring this wonderful event to fruition. My role this morning is to share some thoughts on the topic of Yibum and Chalitza from a biblical perspective. More specifically, I will focus on the experience of yibum, or leveret marriage, for women as it's described in the Torah and in Nach, the books of the prophets and writings. As you know from your study of Masechet Yivamot, yibum, or leveret marriage, refer refers to a union between a man and the childless widow of his deceased relative arranged for the purpose of producing a child. English word lever comes from the Latin term that means brother-in-law. The Hebrew description of the act are forms of the root yud bet mem, yibum is the act of lever at marriage, and yivama is the deceased widow. Through the process of yibum, the child of a union between a man and his deceased brother's widow provides a posthumous heir for the deceased brother and preserves the inheritance of the deceased for the widow and her child. Yibum also assured men in society that their name and memory would continue even after death if they died without a child. There's evidence that Yibum was practiced both in ancient Israel and in other ancient cultures, such as the Hittite culture, the Middle Assyrian societies, different cultures considered different male relatives as qualified miyabnib. In some, only a biological brother was qualified, but in others, any male relative within a larger kinship constellation was a possible miyabe. There are only two texts in the Torah itself that explicitly deal with the obligation of Yibo. They are the story of Judah and Tamar in Breshit Lamechet in Genesis 38, and then the legal discussion of Yibum and Chalitza in Dvarim 25, verses 5 through 10. First appearance of Yibum is in Breshit, chapter 38. The story of Yehuda and Tamar is number one in your source sheets. The source sheets, I believe, are in the chat. They're there for your reference. I'm not going to be going through them, um, but I will refer to them. In the story of Yehuda and Tamar, we're going to focus on verses 2 through 11. In these psukim, Yehuda marries a Canaanite woman and has three sons with her, Er, Unan, and Shela. Er, the oldest son who's married to a woman named Tamar, dies without children. Onan, the younger brother, accepts the responsibility of having relations with Tamar, but deliberately avoids impregnating her with a child. Onan dies as well, and upon his death, the boom responsibility therefore falls on Shelah, 
right? He is now the uh, baby. You can see this in verse eight. The youngest, he's the youngest brother and the responsibility now falls on him. However, fearing that Tamar is somehow the cause of both of his son's deaths, Aaron Onan, who da avoids having his youngest son, Sheila, have relations with Tamar. The source sheet should be in the chat, uh, but don't worry if you can't pull it up right away because I will uh, tell you everything you need to know, <laughs> okay? All right, now it's clear from the Torah that a child of the union of, of Tamar and Sheila as Mia Bain would have been considered the child of the deceased brother, Heir. But things go awry as the story progresses. Amar waits in vain for Yehuda to fulfill his promise to give her Shayla in Yibun, in Leverett marriage. Therefore, as the text moves forward in Bereshit 38, verses 12 through 30, Tamar puts a veil on herself and places herself strategically in Yehuda's path. Thinking that she's a prostitute, Yehuda purchases her services and unknowingly impregnates his own daughter-in-law with twin sons. When he hears later that his daughter-in-law is pregnant, he presumes that she has committed adultery, adultery and he declares that she be sentenced to death by burning. But when Yehuda is confronted with evidence that Tamar is actually carrying his own offspring, Yehuda declares that Tamar is more righteous than himself. And I want you to focus on this verse, which I'll read to you. Yehuda acknowledged and said, Tamar is more righteous than I, because I did not give her to my son, Shayla. Now, this complex story concludes with what seems to be a positive outcome from the biblical perspective. Tamar gives birth to twins, Peretz and Zerach. The book of Ruth later clarifies that Peretz, the son of Tamar and Yehuda, is the direct ancestor of David HaMelech, of King David. Tamar is thus the mother, and Yehuda is the father of the Israelite kingship or monarchy. In the biblical story then of Yehuda and Tamar, the institution of Yibum did its job, so to speak, served to correct a seeming injustice in society. Yibum guaranteed that the Yivama, the surviving wife, Tamar would be assured of livelihood and physical protection by her deceased husband's family. The Bible frequently speaks of the challenges of widowhood, and Yibum is a way in which a childless widow's place in society is reinstated so that she can receive the support that she needs. Finally, in this story, Yibum accomplished the more mystical goal of assuring that heirs, lineage, and memory would continue after his death, even though he had not produced an heir. So, the story of Yehuda and Tamar suggests that Yibum is a tool of what I would call tzedek, or justice, in ancient society. Yehuda's declaration, Sadika Mimeni, is more than a statement of relative morality in his specific situation. Rather, it provides a larger perspective on how the human system of Yibum, of leveret marriage, restores the status quo of a just society, even when tragic events like the premature death of a husband interferes with the expected inheritance and security of a family. This is so even at the cost of the seeming violation of certain taboos, in this case, the relations between Yehuda, who is a father-in-law, with his daughter-in-law, Tamar. Now, moving on in the Torah, Sefer Devarim also describes the ceremony of Yibum, but in a different textual medium. As you're aware, Dvarim chapter 25, Sukim 5 through 10, offers a detailed legal treatment of Yibum, 
of Leverett marriage. Uh, I gave it to you in source number two, and you can uh, look at it as you wish. These psukim in the Varim reframe the practice of yibum in the Torah in a number of respects. First, the obligation of Leverett marriage falls on the deceased man's brother. There's no mention of a more expanded kinship constellation, such as a father-in-law, which was the case in the story of Yehuda and Tamar. Furthermore, it is Devarim that introduces the process of release from Leverett marriage, and that, of course, is Chalitza. The process of Chalitza is initiated at the discretion of the intended Miyabim, the deceased man's brother, but it's performed publicly by the widow and, shall we say, the Yibum refuser through a ritual in which both declare that the man refuses to perform Yibum on his pre-deceased brother's wife. The widow removes the sandal of the refuser, spits in his face, and declares, and this is in Varim Perek Hafei, 25.9, so shall it be done unto the man that does not build up his brother's house. Uh, and I have this very uh, funny recollection. In eighth grade, I had to do a play about Yibam and Chalitza, believe it or not. Um, and so we came up with a little play about it. And what I remember most distinctly is that after the sandal was taken off, we started spraying Lysol all over the room. And everyone but it was very funny. So thank you, Rabbi Michelle, for my second uh, experience of really delving into Yibub and Chalitza. So back to Devarim Chafei. Finally, the refuser's family is dubbed thereafter Beit Chalutz Hana'o, or the house of the unsandaled one, because he refused to build up his brother's house. His pejorative nickname degrades his own house. Now, I believe that the institution of Chalitza and Sefer Devarim serves to reinforce the importance of Yibum as a protective ritual for widows while acknowledging its pitfalls in real human experience. Sometimes the goal of Tzedek must be balanced against the trauma of family discord. The purpose of Yibum is to repair the lines of continuity that result from a man's death without children and to secure the status of the childless widow. It's evident, however, that Yibum can at times create tension because it imposes a too great personal or economic burden on the potential miyabein, or because it unites a couple who might not be suitable for each other. Chalitzabas is the exception that strengthens the rule by providing a technical way out when Yibum interferes with family harmony. The final possible example of Yibum and Chalitza in the Bible is not in the Torah, in the Torah but rather in the book of Tubim in Megillat Rut. Most ancient and modern interpreters with Rashi and Ibn Ezra as notable exceptions, assume that the marriage between Ruth and Boaz is a leveret union, is Yibum. They believe that in Ruth 3 9, Gimel Teth, Ruth is basing her request of Boaz for redemption on the assumption that Boaz is a Boel. He's a redeemer who must redeem Ruth and Naomi's land through leveret marriage. Thus, Ruth stealthily approaches Boaz when he's asleep on the threshing floor, and they have the following exchange. And this is um, in Ruth 3 9. Vayomer miat, vatomer, anochi Ruth amatecha, varasta kinafecha alamatcha, ki goelata. He says, Who are you? And she answers, I'm Ruth, your handmaid. Spread your garment over me because you are the redeeming kinsman. Further evidence that this is a yibum or yibum-like situation is drawn from chapter 4, verse 5 of Mi'ilad Rut, where Boaz declares that the acquisition of Ruth by Peloni Almoni the relative with the first right of refusal for leveret marriage of Ruth and for acquisition of her husband's family property would serve to, and I'm quoting the words, lehakim shem hamet al nachlato, to perpetuate the name of the deceased 
upon his estate. Now, the Hebrew phrase lahakim shem, to establish the name of the deceased husband, appears in identical language in the legal passage de describing Yibum in Dvarim chapter 25, verse 7. Furthermore, in chapter 4 of Megillat, Ruth Boaz strategically describes two aspects of the Boel's duties, of the Redeemer's duty. It's both the redemption of land, but not only that, it's also Yibum, it's also leveret marriage to Ruth. Boaz emphasizes this double duty, if you will, to induce Poloni, the potential Boel, to cede his redemption rights and responsibilities to Boaz. Indeed, Boaz is successful. Poloni is concerned that taking Ruth as a wife would interfere with his existing nachala and perhaps also his current family equilibrium. Finally, the narrative in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, which I encourage you to look over on your own, clearly and definitively evoke the description of Yibum and Chalitza as these rituals are described in Sefer Dvarim, Perek Chafe, verses 5 through 10. A striking proof is the allusion in Ruth 4.12 to the biblical personalities of Yehuda, Tamar, and Peretz. The townspeople, right? The townspeople um, bless the marriage of Ruth and Boaz and say, let your house be like the house of Peretz whom Tamar bore unto Yehuda of the seed, which the Lord shall give you of this young woman. This verse reinforces the argument that following the Chalitza ceremony with Poloni, Almoni, Ruth and Boaz indeed had a yibum, a leveret marriage. So where does all this leave us? I would suggest that the very fact that a version of yibum and Chalitza is the medium that moves the plot of the story of Ruth and Boaz to its positive conclusion speaks volumes about the symbolic significance of these rituals in biblical times. In the book of Ruth, Chalitza and Yibum are the vehicles for correcting a societal injustice and restoring the desired status quo. There's much to be said about how the story of Ruth is a literary redress or tikkun of the earlier story of Yehuda and Tamar. But I will mention two examples as they're most relevant to our Siam discussion this evening. First, by arranging to be married to Boaz rather than simply having relations with him, Ruth, with the guidance of Naomi and the consent of Peloni and the support of Boaz, is able to create a legal and public redemption of her deceased husband's name and property. And by doing so, she enables Boaz to cleanse the line of the tribe of Yehuda from the more questionable conduct, questionable conduct of Yehuda in his interactions with Tamar in Breshit 38. And second, by treating Ruth with respect and dignity in the private and public spheres through Yibum and redemption of the land of her dead husband, Boaz actually and symbolically reverses the pattern of subjugation of women in the era of the Shotim. I want to make this point very sharply. The book of Ruth opens with the words, Vayihibi me shifota Shotim, and it came to pass in the days when the Shoftim ruled. And this calls attention at the very onset to the historical context of the story of Ruth, the era of the judges. The era of the Shoftim or judges in ancient Israel was in many ways a time of anarchy and social disorder. Most notably, it was a time when women were subject to the unchecked power of the patriarchy. And two striking examples from this book, from the book of Shoftim, are first, the sacrifice of the daughter of the judge general Yiftah, resulting from his careless vow before going out to war. And I just mentioned the pshat. And second, the rape and mutilation of the concubine, the kilekech, of a man from the tribe of Levi while traveling in the territory of Binyamin in the story of Pilegesh Begiva, the concubine from Giva. I believe that Megillat Rut 
that in Megillat Rut, Boaz, who himself is from Beit Lechem Yehuda, symbolically purges the violation of the Pilegesh, who is similarly from Beit Lechem Yehuda, in the troubling story that is recounted in the closing chapters of Sefer Shotim. The language similarities between the two stories, Pilegesh Begiva and Megillat Rut, are striking, while the contrasting outcomes are jarring. In the story of Pilegesh Begiva, the solution to the tragedy of an oppressed Israelite woman, in this case, her horrific rape and mutilation, is the drawing of swords. The language is Sholech Cherev in a civil war between the tribes of Am Yisrael. This is verses 15 and 17 of chapter 20 of Sefer Shoftim. It's in your source for Vayit Pakdu B'nei Bin Yamin Bayom HaHumei HaArim Esrim V'Shisha Elef Ish Sholech Cherev there were 26,000 men that were Shalei Cherev that drew swords. And this again is repeated two verses later. In the book of Ruth, however, Boaz deals with the tragedy of poor and widowed women, Ruth and Naomi, not with military force, but with due process in a public forum. This is the redemption process that is described in chapter four of Mi'ilat Ruth. And I want you to look at the language because it blew me away when I saw this. Look specifically at chapter four of Megillat Ruth, verses seven and eight. Vizot lifanim bi Yisrael al hadulav al hatimura lekayim kol davar shalaf ishna alov natan lereihu. This was the custom in ancient Israel concerning redemption. A man threw off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this is what Plony said to Boaz, and he drew off his shoe, Vaishlof Na'alo. The language similarity is unmistakable and the message is even more powerful. In organizing and overseeing the ceremonies of Chalitza and Yibum in Rut, chapter four, verses seven through eight, Boaz is Sholef Na'al rather than Sholef Cherev. By using this language parallel, Megillat Ruth suggests that in performing the ceremonies of Chalitza and Yibum, Ruth and Boaz are together negating the anarchy and repression of women in the era of the Shoftim. And the ultimate and highly positive consequence of their conduct from the biblical perspective is that Boaz and Ruth prepare the line of Yehuda for the advent of King David. In summary, Read together and in light of each other, the laws of Yibum and Chalitza in Varim 25 and their practical enactments in the story of Yudan Tamar and finally in the story of Ruth and Boaz teach one of the most crucial messages of the Bible. Yibum and Chalitza are not simply vessels of an ancient system of common law. Rather, Yibum and Chalitza and Tanakh symbolize the role of the rule of law in organizing Israelite society and the superiority of the rule of law over military coercion and socio-political oppression. In the Bible, the possibility of human dignity and a kind and just society is expressed through the practice and symbolism of the ceremonies of Yibum and Chalitza. And perhaps this idea is hinted and in the very root of the word chalitza, chet la mitzadi, this root is often related to the plunder of war, to a, a military procession, as in chalutz. But in the Torah, chet la mitzadi is also the root of chalitza, a mechanism of a peaceful, functioning society. The Bible teaches that communal ritual, in some cases creatively administered by individuals and institutions, paves the way for human beings to take care of those in their midst who are in need of support and sustenance. This is most evident in the story of Ruth. Boaz built support for his noble intentions by expanding the sanctioned tradition of the Miyabe, or redeeming relative. Ruth's courageous conduct and sterling reputation as a nation chayel and caregiver for Naomi invigorate her cause in the eyes of the Beit Lechem community. 
the people of Beit Lechem, who are well aware of the irregular nature of the marriage of Ruth and Boaz, as is evident by their comparison of it to the union of Yehuda and Tamar, nonetheless publicly affirm the marriage. And finally, God places his imprimatur on the process and the result by granting Ruth her pregnancy in a unique biblical articulation in Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. Vayikach Boaz et Ruth atilo lisha vayavo eleha vayitain Hashem la herayon vateled ben. God gives root conception, and this is a unique articulation, not just the climax of this book, but a unique articulation in the Bible. This, I believe, is also the intent of two beautiful and resonant Midrashim and Rut Rabbah, with which I will close. They are cited in your sources six and seven um, of your source sheets. He doesn't talk about the nuances of purity or impurity. Why was it written? To teach you the reward that awaits those who do acts of kindness. And finally, Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Boaz Asad Shalo. The root Asad Shala, the Naomi Asad Shala, Amar Tadoch Baruch Hu, Ahani Asad Shali. Boaz did his part, Ruth did her part, Naomi did her part. And so God says, I too will do my part. To conclude, the book of Ruth models the process for human beings to preserve a just society even when this may require courage, creativity, and even constructive change. The marriage of Ruth to Boaz and the resulting birth of King David are biblical expressions of the highest honor and accolade. They confirm that the ceremonies of Chalitzai Yibum, with its roots in the earlier story of Tamar Yehuda and the Law in Dvarim 25, are indeed vehicles for social justice and tikkun olam. I leave you with that thought and thank you again for joining the Hadran Siyum Amasechat Yivamot today. Shabuatov, everybody.